The Huskers suffered a heartbreaking loss on Saturday as they fell to the Badgers 24 to 17 in overtime. With one game remaining on the schedule and a bowl game rebirth on the line, how will Nebraska perform against a ranked Iowa team? Tonight, we break down the Wisconsin game and preview a Black Friday matchup with our special guest, former Husker Zach Potter. Sean Callahan will join us to take a look at recruiting as well. All that and more next on Big Red Wrap-Up. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Severe, and welcome to Big Red Wrap-Up on Nebraska Public Media. Nebraska drops another opportunity to make it bowl eligible, but they do have one more opportunity left, and we'll talk about that tonight. Joining me, former Huskers Jay Moore and Damon Benning. I think this one was more frustrating in a way than the two weeks before because there are so many chances Nebraska had, especially at the end of the half, to get points, and then, of course, the end of the game. Yeah, I'm, the Maryland game was still more frustrating was it? to okay. me just because of turnovers. The turnovers. In the end game situation, that end game situation mm -hmm. at Maryland bugged me more than, than Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, just because you had a chance to take the lead easily, in my opinion, and you, you chose not to. Uh, but this week, it, with, with the Wisconsin game, a lot of unknowns, right? Because you don't know what Chubba Purdy is going to present. Uh, you don't know uh, what Wisconsin was going to present with Mordecai and uh, Brandon Allen being back. Uh, defensively, how they're figuring things out, handling Mordecai, ending game situations obviously coming up again in, yeah. in this one. Uh, but to me, it comes down to the defense inability to make stops when they needed to. Uh, and I know they did make some cr some crucial fourth, fourth, uh, fourth and one stops. I do understand that. But to keep Mordecai in the pocket and then special teams. Yeah. And it's a game where the special teams uh, were just not good enough. And really, honestly, you could look at the special teams as why they lost this game. Yeah, I'm kind of in agreement. I think Maryland was probably a little more frustrating, but primarily because I didn't feel like Maryland was as well prepared. They seemed a little more disjointed. They had the 10 penalties, a, lot, a little sloppy. Mm -hmm. um, that one really left a mark. I think Wisconsin, I think the staff is extremely capable. Right, I mean, Coach Hitchler and Coach Tressel, like the defensive staff, yeah. they hadn't given up any points in the second half in, in what would have been, set, you know, 11 quarters. And so Nebraska finally broke that string of a score in the second half. And I think, um, you know, the situational awareness for this team has been so elusive. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the little things that have been magnified are correctable, right? You, you start with how you want to be as an offense. You figure out some consistency in special teams, because I think tactically, the special teams is in a good spot. Technically, like the execution, just hasn't been what you expected it to be. And it's interesting because, you know, four weeks ago, we felt like Bushini and those guys were kind of on the uptick. Yeah. Obana was in a rhythm, Bushini was punting well, and all of a sudden it seems to have kind of left them a little bit. But I'm with Jay. Um, if you can get two of your three facets, Nebraska can win every game. They just can't go one out of three. In the last couple of weeks, they've been one out of three, whether it's been offense, special teams, you know, defense, special teams, defense, offense, and the special teams. You know, it, they can't be one out of three, yeah. but I, but they have gotten away with being two out of three. Yeah, we'll get more into this, of course, as we go along. we got a lot to talk about tonight. We can't wait to get to all your pre-submitted questions and comments. This episode is pre-recorded, though we will not be uh, taking any calls to the show because of that. We look forward to taking them next week when our call room is back up and running. As always, feel free to share your thoughts with us via email, bigred at nebraskapublicmedia.org, or on our Big Red wrap-up social media accounts. In last week's sideline survey, we asked you a simple question. Nebraska was going to make a bowl this year. And look at that, 50-50. Mm. Yes and no. <clears throat> that's, that's where we are right They're now. They're well, they won't, right? Oh, yeah, exactly. That's the way it works. <laughs> if you didn't vote on last week's sideline survey, be sure to check out our new one, which is up right on the website right now. It asked the question, what was the biggest letdown against Wisconsin? Was it the offense, the defense, or the special teams? Well, we'll get to that right now. We'll take a look at Saturday's highlights. It certainly was a great start for Nebraska. I know that people love night games. It wasn't very crowded early in that game, and so it wasn't a lot of noise there in the stadium, and Nebraska took advantage of it early, I thought, offensively. Yeah, that was interesting. I, I, I blinked and I wondered where all the people came from. Yeah. Right, I mean, it was a late arriving crowd, but they eventually got there. Early on, you got Emmett Johnson and Anthony Grant having two good runs, and then 
You know, I, I'd love to watch Emma Johnson run. I can't wait till he gets over 20 yards one year when he's playing here, but eventually he will. Uh, talk about Joe Purdy and his speed. Yeah, just seeing the crease and being the crease. How about that? He made his mind up and and hit it, hit it. And apparently he has a bad groin too. Yeah, it is. It is. It has not been good. I mean, this was amazing. Watch him make his mind up, just so decisive. Oh, see an opening? I'm through the opening. This is what Coach Rule talked about. Your first start or early on, you're not thinking. No. And maybe someone who's been playing thinks a little bit more on that play. That's 100% accurate, especially. I, and I think a lot of that is Purdy's personality in general. Yeah, here's Purdy getting the ball to Malachi Coleman with a nice catch right there. And this is where he kind of got hot. These little smoke routes, they run a lot. I'd rather do it without having the blocker out there because the yeah. blocker gets beat too often. Yeah, and, you know, Wisconsin made a, an adjustment coverage here as we, as we take it to look at the big play. Yeah, this is Jalen Lloyd, one of your West Side guys. Not a big guy, but took the shot and came off. Yeah, he's grown quite a bit, gotten a lot stronger, got away with the corner falling off. You see, that that vertical route along the sidelines, he's got to push for depth. Oh, yeah. The right. corner falls off. He gets a chance to make a play on Lloyd and Jalen. Just, just, just not having four as they try to with the throwback. To when that was open. You see that? Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they read go. that. Wisconsin knew that was coming. <laughs> Throwback. Uh, again, here is uh, Chubby Purdy having a, a really good first half overall, making moves. And when he ran, as Damon said earlier, he was really decisive, made a lot of runs, 14 carries for 105 yards. Here's the fourth and two where the momentum changes. Yeah. I just, love the call. I yeah. love going for it there. You know, the when those guards are covered up, it's just hard to play with yeah. pinning and trying to pull, right? Yep, it's it it's tough. It's very yeah, tough. Scott got blown up in the middle with that. Um, not blaming it on him, but that's what happened in there. And then Tanner Mordecai got hot, hit four throws rows in a row leading Wisconsin down the field and then Jay we're going to get to the play where they run um kind of a wheel right out of the backfield. What happens here? Yeah, it's just uh, there is some sort of miscommunication because you can, you're not allowing Ty Robinson, a defensive tackle, to have sure. this guy in coverage. The outside linebacker, I don't know, the safety got tied up. There was a, definitely a miscommunication mismatch, and Wisconsin took advantage of it. That makes it 14-7. I thought this was the key to the game coming in. Mordecai using his legs in the pocket, moving, and then also running on both scramble and design runs. And this pauling was just great all day, wasn't it? I tell you, that missed tackle right there came back to haunt him a couple of times. and. Covering guys in the slot is difficult. It is, and that was a play, a trick play, obviously, that they still took advantage of. That's Bell for 10 yards, leads to this field goal to make it 14-10 heading into the half, but Nebraska gets the ball back and has a chance to try to get some points. Chubba Purdy still throwing the ball well in the first half to Bullock for 13 yards here on a first down. Then he comes back. This is a great route to Malachi Coleman. Yeah, and, and you know what? He kind of mistimed his jump. I thought it was, but it was a great hole throw. Yeah, put it right where it needed to be, and here's Purdy again, putting him in field goal range, and as we talked about, you know, Tristan Albano struggling a little bit as a freshman, pushed that one a little bit. Yeah, just uh, in, uncharacteristic, too. I felt like he would kind of found his kicking rhythm. He had. Uh, they come out in the second half. Nebraska has not been very good in the third quarter, stopping people. Again, you see Wisconsin coming out, getting Mordecai, using his legs, making plays, and then here's Pauling again. Just uh, took advantage a lot in the slot. Yeah, that missed tackle was tough, and I kind of think it broke their spirits momentarily. And then you have to figure out how you want to defend slot receivers. And that was Pauling again with the catch. And there's Braylon Allen after only playing really three plays the week before, comes in and has a very good game. 17-14, uh, Wisconsin takes the lead. This is the point, though, where Nebraska's defense, as they've been doing over and over again, ends up starting to make some plays, and they did here. I know you had a couple completions. You had Braylon Allen getting his best run of the day here, going for 17 yards. They actually did a really good job against him. Yeah, 22 for 63. I mean, you're not... Yeah, I'm not crying about that. Then third and one, what a great play by Phil and Sanford, man. Yeah, he's man, a tough kid. Yeah, he is a hit stick. I know yeah. he's used to tackling cattle, but why not ball players <laughs> he, as well? He's given up 30 yards on 30 pounds on that one. I think he actually tackles. Doesn't calves, right? Yeah, is, it, okay. is it a whole cattle? Because that would be. <laughs> that would be. I was terrible with 4-H, but I do know one thing. Whatever he hits, usually stops moving. <laughs> he is a tough guy. And then again on fourth and one, did the exact same thing. Nash Upmacher get in there and help make that stop as well. Just really, really good stop there to get the, get the ball back. And then here comes the. Nebraska coming down, coming back again. Joe Purdy's made a great job with his legs. 22 yards on this one. And right here, 135 remaining with three timeouts. 135. Oh, I understand. You've got to get more plays than they did. And I understand you don't want to give the ball back, but Joe Purdy gets that first down. Then all of a sudden you got 20 yards. I mean, 20 seconds left on the clock. You make the throw to the end zone. At least they got it off, unlike in the first half where they almost ran out of time. And then here's the tie from Tristan Alvarado getting back on the horse and making that one to make it 17-17. But it means Nebraska's going to overtime, where they haven't scored since 2014, where they haven't gotten a first down since 2014. But still, they're in great spot. You got Brillin Adam, you stop him for one yard again. You do, second down, you do the exact same thing. This is a big play right here. It is. So they got to the face of Pauling with the inside backer, but it left a little void with the third crosser, and it just bought time. 
They didn't show up, but there was a tripping call and a holding that was missed by the officials. It allows Wisconsin to get down there, and then you have the push with everybody with Braylon Allen getting in the end zone, making it 24 17. Yeah, the whistle may, might have been able to blow there a little bit. It went for a while, but <laughs> that push stuff is what we have now. It's just the way it was, the brotherly shove kind of thing. And then Nebraska again. What happens in this option? Right so there? I think he's got an RPO, right? He can throw it. Step too, back and throw it, right? Right. And then he went with the option. I know people didn't love the play call. I did like the option. Boundary field, you can debate that, but I did like the play call. He had a couple throws late, and it looked like there that Malachi jumped a little early. Oh, Jalen. Jumped a little early. Yeah. The first one before that when Malachi jumped a little early, but ends up Wisconsin wins the game 24 17. We go to final stats. And you look at the game, it was fairly even. You had one team that, you know, did a lot of really good things. Nebraska only turned the ball over one time. That's big. When you average 11.3 yards a completion, that's outstanding. Penalties weren't that bad. It really was a game that came down to a couple plays. Um, players of the game, let's go to that now and take a look at it. Our player of the games this week, of course, Chubba Purdy, not a surprise the way he played in his first start. Uh, and Marcus Buford, who, coming back from an injury, being out as long as he has, he got right back into it. Uh, Chubba had 274 total yards. Meanwhile, Marcus dominated the defensive side, led the team in tackles as well with 10, playing really, really well. I, I want to go back again to the end of the game. Okay. okay. There's a couple things you can do there. I thought the timeout should have happened at 45 seconds. Play ends, you have a chance to call a timeout at 45. And because they went from, what, a minute 35 to 50 seconds and then 50 to 20. And they ran the play. Yeah, so in that situation, you can call the timeout at 40, which means as long as you get the first down, and you got to say that, right? Mm -hmm. As long as you get the first down, yep. you probably got three plays left to run, including a running play if you want because you still have a timeout left. In that situation, how much do you think Coach Rule was thinking about the week before? Uh, I, I really don't. I think what he was thinking about was – he wanted to end the game with his team having the ball, right? I, he wanted to be aggressive, but I think the real mistake, if he had, a, if he had it to do over again, because I kind of listened close in the presser on mm -hmm. Monday, and I think at the minute 35 mark, when Wisconsin inexplicably called timeout, they right? I, I don't, they looked maybe like they were a little misaligned they were trying to gather. disjointed. Yeah. You probably call a play. The next play is when you'll use the first timeout mm -hmm. and see what happens with the yardage. They ran the play and then let the clock run because I don't think they had the success they wanted. That's the seek. That's right there in that little sequence is what I think that they would do different. What I was thinking about the week before was because Nebraska gave the ball back to Maryland and they drove down. He didn't want to see that happen again, where his defense gives up a, a drive. I felt like. He felt like he had more control of Wisconsin's offense in this one mm -hmm. than he did Maryland a week ago. Mm. I don't know if I, that's just, I'm yeah. speculating, but Maryland going to that north end zone was moving the ball at a pretty good clip. Mm -hmm. I just didn't, I think he had much more respect for Maryland's offense than he did for Wisconsin's ability to do the same. But I, I'm speculating. But I think, I think. You what happened the week previous in Maryland had something. It has to go into your psyche. It has to go into your decision making to some extent. Again, Maryland did have the wind, obviously, and that was a big factor. It was, the wind wasn't a factor no, against it yeah. Wisconsin. But I think for what happened, I, I agree, one time out there on the 40-second mark probably should have been utilized. But if not, wait, the last thing you want to do is give the other team a chance to win the game. Sure. And I think the end game situation against Maryland, I know we've discussed this already, bugs me more how they handled that I th I'm okay with how they handled against Wisconsin if you think that your best opportunity is to go ahead and win in overtime let's do that and make sure the team doesn't get get the ball back you know, so I'm okay they were aggressive I'm okay. against Wisconsin they were aggressive against Maryland and they were seemingly tentative mm -hmm. not to make a mistake against you know, you know what I think is a little bit of a misnomer I'm curious to see what you guys think I think the whole at home you do this and on the road you yeah. do th this that's, that's I, think that's, I think that's yeah. a little overblown it's a cliche yeah. I think it's about the flow of the game sure. and where you are with and he the said, style like, of play he says it though too he goes there's an analytics part of it but there's also a feel oh, as definitely. a coach yeah. so yeah. I think he said the analytics said this but he's like I had a feel for how this game was going and, and again I, I truly do believe what happened last week had has a decision yeah. even though if he might he might not have said it or if he did said it but it's just I've never been a head coach in, in that moment yeah. um, and sometimes you do have to go with your gut or your heart what, what tells you uh, over over what a computer might tell you I think what you were saying that rule, I think, falls on if you're going for two. Mm -hmm. So you're late in the game or you're in overtime and you're at home, I don't mind tying and going to a next overtime. 
But if you're on the road, I think you go for two. You that's the one time I think that's always gone. You know, and, and we should we could probably do a little homework here, but I, I think every head coach needs a timeout guy. Oh, a definitely. situational yeah. timeout mm -hmm. guy. And, and and maybe Nebraska has it, maybe they don't. But I, I do I say that to say I think it's much more difficult situationally with timeouts as the head coach to be efficient at it than it is to not. Because we've seen a lot of great coaches that are not very good with time management. And sometimes Her it's because- was bad they, at it for a long time. Well, Andy Reid, yeah. you know, Vrabel. Sure. There's, a, there's a ton of guys okay. that I think, I mean, the end game thing is tough, so you always kind of have to have that guy. Yeah. And, and it's a trust thing, right? And if I'm an alpha and I'm, and I'm overseeing a group, I've got to have somebody that I know can come to me and I can go to them and they can correct me and let me know what's going on in real time. I think everybody needs that. Let's go to Chubba Purdy and the way he played. Um, this goes back to a lot of things that Coach Rule has said. Get that first start. You come out. You play loose. He really played loose. Yeah, I was. I didn't. Wasn't quite sure what to expect. We sure. saw him at times last last year. Did not look up to the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the game was <laughs> very very fast for him. I, and I don't know how healthy he was last year either. But seeing what he saw against Maryland in that one drive, like, okay, is that uh, is that Chuba? Is that Fluky? What's what's the situation? And he comes out like, okay, yeah. Like yeah. the scene. The situation was not too big. Now, I think the biggest thing I saw from him, and I, we've we've hit on this already, is he made quick decisions. And I think what's hurt Jeff Sims and Heinrich Harburg in the past, and sometimes you can try too hard and try to do too much as a, as a quarterback, whether that's bouncing it outside when you shouldn't, uh, extending a play too far when you shouldn't, not throwing the ball away, but it seems like Chubba made his mind up right away. If, it, if the first or second look wasn't there, boom, I'm tucking it or I'm throwing away. Uh, he just did a really good job, and uh, the game didn't seem too fast for him. The, the game was called very, very well for him. Only, only since the time he struggled yeah. was some of those those, those boundary blitzes that got him. Yeah. And, and I think he'll continue to see those again from Iowa this week, which I think he's going to learn from. But overall, he exceeded my expectations in this one. Real quick, to be able to with the coaching, both those guys, when they crossed the end zone, Covered it up with two hands. Yeah. That's pure. Co that's taking the coaching because you know Matt Rule preaches that. Yeah, don't let go of the ball until you cross. Yeah, and don't let somebody come <laughs> yeah. from behind you. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I always, I sometimes I hear people joke, and I use it in my own household. Like you don't get this life without me in it. And I think with Coach Satterfield, you don't get Purdy's development, and and even Heinrich Harburg. Mm -hmm. You know, Jeff Sims. I don't know where he was at at, at Georgia Tech, where versus where I saw him. But we have to be honest with ourselves and say Harburg is better this season than we last time we saw him in the yeah. spring. Purdy's better right now than the last time we saw him in spring. So for all the hand wringing and consternation about you know sequential play calling or pet plays or whatever, the development at the quarterback spot doesn't appear to be something I'm like that's keeping me up at night, right? Because they're not better by osmosis, right? I mean they they appear to be getting better within the offense from the last time we saw him. Now, the next phase for a coordinator is to dev to continually develop. If you're going from a two to a six or a six to a seven or whatever, it's okay, there's tape now. How do we next level this thing? And not just Satterfield, if we talk about all the young guys who have made strides through the season, you have guys who are freshmen, never played before at this level, that continue to get better. That talks to the assistant coach. 100%. I think that's development. I think that speaks to some of those young guys that did come in at spring. Mm -hmm. You get some extra reps. Uh, it's, it's, it's not only for the offense, but I think it's for the defense as well. Yeah. You've seen a lot of young guys too. I think So that speaks volumes to how the staff has approached development, uh, approached their weekly preparation, how they do it, uh, approach um, having maturity in the meeting room. And understanding, because it's as a young player, if you know you're not your third, fourth string, it's pretty easy to sit back in the in, uh, in the back of the of the meeting rooms and kind of maybe doze off, nod off, not pay attention. <laughs> yeah. I think it, this, this doesn't matter. This this right now, I'm never going to play. But I think they're holding everyone accountable yeah. uh, in those meeting rooms. Yeah. So and, and it shows because uh, you it's a process. You just can't go out there and, and perform as quickly as these guys did if you don't understand it and how to do it on a whiteboard and then go to a walkthrough and then go to mm -hmm. uh, a practice, and then obviously take it to a game. So uh, I love how they have approached uh, that process, because I think that's uh, something we have not seen from a couple of staff so far. Yeah, I think he's spot on. I mean, sometimes they don't always make these grand announcements, but sometimes you'll see guys sitting for 
an extended amount of time or they've missed series or they were playing and all of a sudden they've disappeared for a while. I think the holding people accountable thing is seriously an hour to hour thing in Lincoln now. It, it is, you better do what's asked of you over the long haul or there's gonna be consequences. Both on and off the field. 100%. Yeah. I mean, the discipline that I think you have to have to, to remain and function in this program is at a high level. I think there's, there's, I think there's no, they're not allowing anyone to feel sorry for themselves. Yeah. Because you can, you can, oh, oh is me, I'm not playing. Uh, it's so easy to transfer. It's so easy to find an excuse. You know, we lost another one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but or another I, injury. It's, yeah. Hey, yeah. uh-uh. That's yeah. let's next man up. Yeah, because well, yeah, right. what he has proven yeah, is go. he'll find the next let's guy. Get the guy. Yeah. Let's get the guys. Let's go. It's time to go. It's like Bill Callahan said about Joe Gans. It's, it's coaching. That's development. That's right. <laughs> um, let's. Uh, I want to get into Ty Robinson and deciding he's going to come back for a sixth year. How big is that, especially when you're talking about this system? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a five star portal type of. Steel. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, I was not expecting that. Uh, let's be honest, Ty's still going to make some money next year coming back. Uh, he might not be as much as he's, he was making with the, with the NFL signing bonus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's be honest. But I think that just speaks, uh, just kind of that what we just discussed and kind of kind of peeling that onion apart with this team and what really is going on behind the scenes. Yep. Uh, trust. That's one word. You, you trust the staff. Uh, you trust Coach Knighton. You trust Tony White. Uh, fingers crossed that he's still the defensive coordinator. Well, I think that's part of it. it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, sure. Yeah. To your good point. Right? That's a very <laughs> right, valid right, point. Right. But I think coming back for a six year is big. that's big. That is big. And this defense does not have success up front without Ty, without Nash going forward. And I that's that's uh, hats off to 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 uh, that defensive staff and coach rules for if, a, a if, big if, off season if Ruquan Buckley is going to offense, <laughs> yeah. you're probably going to get some help along the defense, yeah. right? I mean, that's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, that's pretty good. No doubt about that. We're happy to announce they have a new winner in this week's game day photo contest. Alyssa sent us this photo of her and her friend Stephanie watching the game from their home with their daughters, Blakely and Kylie. Oh, what a, that's an awesome picture right there. Thanks for sharing with us, Alyssa. We love seeing these kinds of photos. Send them to us. We love having them. Don't miss out on your opportunity to send us your best game day photo for chances to win great prizes throughout the season. We want to see your game day best. So make sure you send those photos in each week, whether you're at the game, you're at home, you're at a tailgate party, wherever you are, send them in to us. With that, we toss it to Jay Moore in the huddle to break down a couple plays from Wisconsin game on Saturday. So we'll look a couple plays defensively. Wisconsin did a good job of kind of counter-punching what Nebraska does defensively in the QB run game or draw game. Uh, Nebraska does like to run a lot of stunts. You can see one here, a, a, a nose tackle type of wraparound. They get caught. Uh, they do a good job of emptying, uh, getting a linebacker out, trying to cover a man-to-man -man situation. Nick Heinrich here does not do, I don't, not quite sure, a miscommunication. He kind of gets, run, runs up in some traffic. But Wisconsin does a good job of getting a guy up into the second <laughs> level. When you're running games two inside, it's hard to kind of figure out. You lose vision, you lose feel of the pocket. And this is kind of what happens. You have an end here that needs to come down. He gets above. He needs to try to come downhill and get him. But you can see him. The, I know the, <laughs> the picture's getting blurry here. But it's just he does a good job of making a decision right here. The, 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 the lineman's up on Heinrich. So right now... Everyone's hat in a hat. He's able to get away, and it's just a good call, and it's a way to expose kind of Nebraska's uh, timing on how they're uh, running their game. So the next one, this is the first uh, one of the plays from, from uh, overtime. So Nebraska's showing six. They're bringing five. They've done this a lot. Right here, you'll see he's getting uh, – uh, Javon Wright's getting up here. Uh, Allen's picking him up. But Luke Reimer right here is, is trying to step out of this, as you've seen a lot. But Wisconsin does a good job of almost grabbing him here a little bit and staying on him, because in this situation, he wants to be able to spy, and he wants to get off and make this play. Gifford right here is in a bad spot, does not get over top. But again, Wisconsin's doing a good job of getting that another lineman up on the second level to make it clear for the QB to get through. You know, Jay, when we watch him, he reminds me, he's going to spend like eight or nine years in the NFL as a backup quarterback, kind of a Chase Daniel guy, because he can come into a game and do this kind of thing. He's really got a natural feel for the game. He does. It's he, Patience. Yeah. That kind of thing is clear. 
Um, but they, uh, listen, they did a good job of countering what Nebraska likes to do defensively and, yeah. and utilized it. And it's, it's not easy to get your linemen to, to get up on the second level against linebackers, but they did it very nicely. I'm yeah. curious, with a, with a quarterback that's that evasive, would you rather be on the move as a D-line or would you rather – would you rather stay in your pass rush? I'd lanes? rather, I'd honestly probably rather stay in my pass rush lanes. No games. Yeah, I think you, you as when you run in those uh, NT, ETs, TEs, you lose, you just kind of lose feel. Mm -hmm. You almost hear your eyes on the and linemen and, he was and not so the quarterback. Patient. Yeah, was really patient. Yeah, waiting for things yeah. to clear yeah. before he decided what he wanted to hit. Yeah, we're gonna step away for a quick short break. But when we come back, our guest, former Husker Zach Potter, will join us. That Creighton prep guy, and we'll also, of course, check out some of the best photos from Madison, courtesy of Herd at Sports. I know they want to win. They they want they want you know. I mean, to think that they're sitting here at Senior Day. A lot of these guys, it's their last game in the stadium. They're playing a ranked team, chance to go to a bowl game. Um, if they lack any motivation, it's all there for them. But uh, I've seen this. I've seen this group do nothing but fight every week all year. The whole season, Coach Rule was always like, if this was your last game and you knew this was going to be the outcome of it, how would you go back and prepare? You know, how would you go back and practice? How would you go back and watch film? How would you go back knowing that this was going to be your last? He was saying that back in fall camp. And now, you know, this is that opportunity, right? Like, it, this could be the last one. You know, the things that they've had to endure and go through and, and stick it out and do it with such a great attitude and willfulness to just give whatever they need for success, whatever that success might be. Uh, you know, the gratitude they have for this university, for this football program is unbelievable to watch day in and day out. And, you know, the one thing that I really uh, appreciate offensively, defensively, all the kid, all the young men is just uh, the trust, like the blind trust that they gave us when we came in and just continuing to build that trust with each other as we go forth. I just want to express my, my deep, deep, deep gratitude for the 24 probably about 24 guys that we're gonna they're gonna walk out on Friday and um, as seniors uh, so a couple guys are still because of COVID you know so some guys are still making some decisions up but um, you can't do this uh, this job without buying from players and these players um, well I think they've bought into us more importantly I think they care deeply about Nebraska and Nebraska football Welcome back to Big Red Wrap Up. Those are just a few comments from the coaches this week as we head into Senior Day. We are pleased to be joined by former Husker and NFL tight end Zach Potter. We appreciate you taking the time. What do you remember from Senior Day? I just remember it, it was going to be my last time walking out of the tunnel uh, in front of 90,000 people. You know, a dream come true for me after growing up in Omaha and playing for uh, 
uh, Nebraska. That just kind of that, you know, the, the closing that chapter of, you know, that was going to be the end of my career at Nebraska. The last time running out there with all my teammates, uh, we had a good senior class. I thought a lot of guys that redshirted in 2004, and then a lot of guys that uh, actually played in 2005. So we had a good class that I thought, and uh, just kind of closing that chapter, and then you know, looking forward to the next chapter. Something that Damon told me that I never really thought about. How did you start off playing? Because it's a lot of emotions to do it before. Mm-hmm. Iowa, for example, does it afterwards. Would you, how did you feel when you first started the game? Were you still kind of on that high of the introduction or what? It's kind of, I would say it's kind of like taking, a, you know, you saw uh, Micah Parsons, you know, taking an extra shot of energy stuff. You know, <laughs> yeah. you kind of had that extra oomph like, to go. Right. So I, I actually enjoyed having it at the, the beginning of the game. Right. Kind of coming down, the crowd's still really into it. Uh, everyone's still, um, you know, enjoying that moment. But it's like, hey, you know, you needed that first hit. You know, yeah. find a teammate on the sideline, you know, you know, hit your helmets together, kind of wake up a little bit. But you were ready to go, and uh, I was excited. It's a, I think the design, it wants to be a tight end friendly offense. It would have been good for a guy like you if you'd have been on the offensive yeah. side in college, potentially. When you watch its evolution, do you get an idea of what they're trying to do f- from a concept standpoint? A little bit, yeah. I mean, I think it's kind of been challenging this year with the, the number of quarterbacks that we've played. Turnovers obviously don't help that by any means, but you know, you look at a guy like Fedoni who has uh, you know battled back from his injuries and he's been able to um, have a good year, I think. I still don't think he's 100%, but yeah. he's he's making uh, the most of what he can do. And so I'm excited, you know, knock on wood, that he can make it through one more game, maybe a bowl game, have another off season to continue building his strength. Because I think he's shown what he's capable of this year, not even being 100%, have another off season, um, hopefully maybe having, you know, a better idea of who your quarterback's going to be for yeah. 2024. And uh, I think, you know, the sky's the limit for him. And then also, you know, for the, the offense, if they can, you know, keep turning the page. The biggest thing is, um, the bowl practice if they can get those whether you're six and six or five and seven or six and seven at that point mm-hmm. uh or be five and seven sorry yeah. but th- that's what those this this team's missed is those bowl practices those, mm-hmm. those development practices mm-hmm. zach one thing they i think we've, we've discussed this as earlier in the show is development i think they've done a fantastic job um we've been young guys in the back of a meeting room and just go go take take yourself back because you played you played early and i know as a, as a, as a freshman in a special teams role but having the maturity to approach it like an older guy and having that ability and having that staff be able to uh, kind of respect you as well because you can, uh, I know as a young guy, they can, you kind of, coaches kind of forget about you, but having uh, the ability to keep you accountable and hold players uh, to, a, to a standard to approach it the same way if they're playing versus not. I think the biggest thing this year, it's, it's, always, it's been a next man up mentality this whole season with the amount of injuries that we've had. So it doesn't matter what position you're playing or where you are on the depth chart, you have to be ready to go in. Um, and I think you saw, at least early in the season, I know when I was kind of following it a lot more, is you saw how much they rotated, especially on oh, yeah. defense, the amount of players that were getting reps. Um, and so that's one of the things, you know, the positives that you might take, you know, uh, eternal optimist in me of like, hey, all these guys are getting this, these game reps this year. That's going to help competition come spring, help, and help the team in 24. Obviously, we want to keep doing better this year, but ultimately having that development, those game reps, Obviously, paying attention in the meetings, uh, not falling asleep in the back. I mean, you know, there's everyone gets tired of watching film at some point. Your eyes get your eyes get heavy, and so if you can stay engaged and, and learn from the tape, I think that's the biggest thing for these guys to continue learning. What about the three-three-five? We call it that majority of the time. You got two big guys with their hands on the ground, and then you have a couple guys standing up. Where do you think you would have played in that? What do you think about the system? Uh, I would have been probably one of the outside three. I certainly, I don't think I was big enough to play the zero necessarily. But I, you know, I was, I was curious to see what it was going to look like coming into the season. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's a three-three-five. But you know, as you mentioned, when that ball is snapped, there's more than three people there all the time. I mean, yeah. it's all about how you line up, and then at your base, and then everything's you know ran off of that. And so, can you imagine with your length playing it over a guard? Uh, you know, three tech. It would have been interesting. I would have had to put on a little bit more weight. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. I mean, I watched Gunnarsson yeah. do it now, and it's uh-huh. just like with your foot. I, That's what's I, been the most impressive thing to me is what seeing multiple guys go in there mm-hmm. and play multiple spots. Yeah. It's like that's a it seems that, like it would be dark well, in there. It's kind of like NFL a little bit. Of, yeah. You know, you have your zeros going out and rushing the passer. You, you're, you're moving around. It's not just hey, you're the base DN or you're the you know, the three tech or you're the zero. It's moving people around and showing different looks and, and using the versatility of the defensive line and, and the linebackers. And think if you're a quarterback. 
you've got to figure out who's coming, who's not coming, who's dropping. It makes it difficult on those. Well, and then obviously, yeah. you know, Ty Robinson coming back next year. I mean, that's, 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 a, that's a huge, um, Jay mentioned early, you know, that's a huge get for the middle of November prior to, you know, December and the chaos that's probably about to happen with, you know, the transfer portal. Yeah. So that's a huge get from the get-go. Let me ask you something, because you did play early and you had success, right? So it's hard to go back and say, oh, gosh, if I sign a contract, I'd like to do it over again. But do you like, would you rather have played when you did or now with a few more rules, but a lot more hybrid versatility? It's a good question. I mean, I think um, I would have liked to play now just for uh, some NIL money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would have been nice. Um, Me too. You yeah. know, I, I don't know if I could I could stay in college for seven years and get my doctorate like some of these guys yeah. Yeah. have. So, I, you know, I look back, I was really happy with the four years that I had playing defense uh, under, some, and under some good coaches, I felt, especially the last year under Carl uh, Pelini and John Papuchis yeah. and some of the things that they were able to teach us mm -hmm. um, after Coach Blake and, and, and Buddy Wyatt and some of those guys. Oh, and so yeah. Oh, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, I never want to look too back, too far in the future and be like, woulda, coulda, shoulda. Sure. I, my career ended up just fine and enjoyed what I had. And so uh, I'm, I'm happy with where I played. Yeah. The two guys I think that if you could have had red shirt and get extra year, I think Zach is one and then now it's Paul would have been the other one. Those mm -hmm. two guys, as fifth years, I think would have been a big time. <laughs> what do you think about just the rivalry with Iowa? I know you guys come after all of that, but mm -hmm. I'm sure you know people who are Iowa fans, right? Your neighbors or people you work with. What do you? What's your feelings on? I that know there's rivalry? there's been a lot more Iowa fans over the last five years that have come out of the woodworks, <laughs> um, for sure. But uh, you know, I, I do think it's it's a great it's a great rivalry. I mean, for the Big Ten, it's it's the rivalry that we should have. You know, Kirk Ferentz has been there a long time. Uh, we'll see what continues to happen with him there, but um, there should be that should be the rivalry of the Big Ten mm -hmm. between Nebraska and Iowa, right across you know the Missouri River there, um, close. And I think ultimately um, it's been a it's been a good rivalry for us, and hopefully we can find a way to get a win you know on Friday. I mean they're a tough team, as bad as you know the media and other people want to make them. I mean they're still like number 15 in the country, going for a 10 win season again. I mean it's consistent, but yeah. ultimately you know. It is what it is. Well, it's what Damon said earlier, right? You can you can win, especially the way it's configured now in the West, with two parts of the game playing well. Mm -hmm. They're great on defense, and they've been spectacular on special teams. If you can put those together, you can have an aver at well, below average offense. It, it, who, it, all that matters is that you win. Yeah. I mean, style points are good, but you know, with the way the the playoffs going to happen, all this stuff. You know, if ne if Nebraska had the same record and it was ugly as Iowa's right now, yeah. would we take it? We'd be fine. Absolutely. You bet we, we would. Be a stat, man. We'd and, be singing and, everyone's praises. We're kind of close to it, really. I mean, right. we just haven't had the wins. We've had the losses on those, those one score victories. I mean, the last three games on the skid, we've lost by I think 13 points. Yeah. I mean, that hurt. turn those three around and we're a completely different conversation. We're at, you know, eight and three, maybe going for a nine win. What was it like when you, you get to the NFL and they say to you at, at some point, hey, we want to move the other side of the ball? Um, my first thought was I'm not going to make it. My second thought was, okay, I'm going to get a paycheck, so that's great. I'll do whatever you want. Right. Um, you know, ultimately, though, it, it was – it was fun, though, because I was able to kind of go back in my roots from Creighton Prep, play tight yeah. end, uh, and do some blocking. And, uh, you know, as the tight end position has evolved, you know, I think it, a lot of credit was given to, you know, the Patriots, you know, Gronk, Aaron Hernandez, those guys that really transformed it into this a, a bigger tight end and a speed tight end. Um, it's amazing what you can do with mismatches uh, from a tight end standpoint, you know, whether you get a linebacker on you, you get a safety coming down. I mean, it's uh, so it, it was fun. I, I, I loved my career. It was a lot of fun. I wish I was still playing. My kids ask all the time why I'm not still playing. Um, <laughs> I say I'm too old. And then, you know, last year they always said, well, Tom Brady's still playing. Why is why can't you keep playing? It's <laughs> a little different, a little different career path. Kids, so. yeah. What are the ages of your kids? Uh, 10, 8 and 5. And they're playing sports? Yep, we're, uh, we're we got our daughters doing acting and all this uh, voice stuff, and then our kids are full go in all the sports. So okay, it's, well, it's I was just recruiting fun. for Westside, so I was just saying <laughs> if you could maybe get some kids over there. I don't know. You I said don't know. that to a prep guy. <laughs> I know. I know. You know, I can't do that. I tried to get Damon to come to prep, but I think there were some other things there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I remember. If we really want to go there, right? we can go there. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So what's your what's your feeling? What happens on Friday? Touche. You know. I, I, again, I'm an eternal optimist. I'll sure. never pick against the Huskers. I know you and I used to do a show yeah, a long time. We, I yeah. never picked against never the Huskers. Picked against, so, yeah. you know, you got probably like a 13 10 Nebraska. It's going to be low scoring. Yeah. Um, you just got to find a way to, to win. That's all that matters. Just, you just need one more. It's, yeah. it's such a big milestone for this team if they can get those extra practices. Um, yeah. That would be huge for the team. Could you, before I let you go, could you rank the Zacks for me? There's so many Zacks over the course. The Zach Taylor, Zach Lee, Zach Potters, all these Zacks. Can you, well, who's who's I, the best Zach in the last 20 years? I got to go Zach Taylor just from a quarterback standpoint. Yeah, any, and obviously it's success do we, count, do we count Zach Miller? 
Oh, a good one. Yeah, you know, he was there wow, in the transfer. You, you know, got Zach call. Lee too. Yeah, yeah. Um, Zach Lee. Yeah, Zach Miller right. maybe. No, if I'm, anybody yeah. else, he may be the best guy. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you guys thing. can. You but guys he didn't can fight finish that. at Nebraska. That is true. We count. Love you, Zach. always said he was a better quarterback than anybody in that room. Such a good person. As a freshman, great player. But I got to go. Zach Taylor probably won. Yeah. You know, don't forget about like Zach Bowman. Oh, good call. Yeah. Yeah. I'd probably put myself behind those two. You know, depend in in my era. I mean, obviously top of that maybe like Zach Wiegert. Obviously. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, was a, good point. he was a yeah. pretty good player. Zach University. He's a, yeah. he's a roller deck. That's really yeah. good, yeah. Last <laughs> I've thing been hitting the head a couple times, but I remember weird <laughs> things. <so. laughs> Last thing, what are you, you doing with yourself now? Uh, I'm in audiovisual sales for a company called CCS Presentation Systems. So we awesome. do conference rooms, boardrooms, uh, projectors, TVs, technology. So it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. Yeah. Zach, we appreciate it, man. Appreciate you. So good seeing you. Me. We want to thank you for coming in and taking the time today. We turn now to this week's Husker Up Close segment featuring a true freshman that's played an instrumental role in the defense this year. Like, game football means everything, you know? Like, it's an opportunity, it's a way of life. And, you know, I spend a lot of time in this game. Um, it means everything to me and my family. I believe in the process that Coach Rule has. Um, when I came here on my recruiting visit, you know, like, they explained it to me. Um, I've seen the potential of playing early. And yeah, just my relationship with our coaches, you know, we're all from like the, like, the same area. Coach Rule's from New York, Coach T. Knight, he's from Connecticut. You know, we're all from the same area. So like, wow, there's no better place to be than be with people from home. A fun fact about me is that I used to DJ and I was a big DJ back in New York City when I was younger. See, that's the thing I play. Whatever people want to hear, I'll play it. I would say I'm a gritty, hard worker. Um, I, I like to play pretty dirty, you know, I don't care where I play, I line up and I just go after it. You know, just playing everywhere, lining up in a three tech shade, whatever, just being able to be versatile, get my, roll up my sleeves, get my hands dirty. So my goals for this season, um, you know, I, like, I like to, to have, I have like a, back in my head, I have a certain number of sacks that I like to get and just being able to like, you know, go one and no each week. Joining me now is Nebraska Public Media Sports intern Hannah. It was a good weekend, I thought, overall for social media, especially on yeah. that Saturday. So you ended up getting three tweets this week. Yeah, we did. Yeah. So our first one we have here is, that run was really purdy. Nice little <laughs> pun. Got a <laughs> wizard giggle in there. Yeah, I like that. Uh, so got that now. The next one is also about uh, Chubba Purdy. Uh, his given name is Preston, but Chubba caught on as a nickname from his dad when he reached 38 pounds as a one-year-old. That is ridiculous. So, he's meant to be a sturdy football player. There's no doubt about that, but 38 <laughs> pounds is crazy. What else you got? Uh, our last one is our defensive line coach celebrating the fact that Ty Robinson has chose to stay here with the Huskers yeah. and use that extra year of eligibility. Have you seen that movie? I have not. Training Day. Oh, I'm trying Good to. movie, yeah. <laughs> Boom. It's always says. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Hannah. We appreciate it. Of course, we'll see Hannah again next week. We'll have to take another short break as we go. Here are more photos from the game in Camp Randall, courtesy of Herd at Sports.
Welcome back to Big Red Wrap Up. I am joined, of course, now by Sean Callian to talk recruiting. Congratulations to both Omaha Westside for winning and for Elkhorn South making it. A lot of good talent on the field last night. Yeah, you talk about a dominating high school football team. I mean, first of all, Westside. Oh, yeah. Um, eight shutouts this season. It's incredible. They, they, they've scored the most points in history for a regular season and the most points in a title game. And we really got a taste of all their stars in that yeah. state championship game. You know, starting with quarterback Anthony Rizak, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you saw the season that he put together, capping it off with some huge plays um, in that state championship he's probably game. the player of the year in the state. Yeah. Everything the, that he's done. They the give out they that win. Gatorade player of the year yeah. award. And, you know, I don't know who votes on that or how it's done, but, you know, he's going to have to definitely be right up there. I mean, there's a lot of guys, uh, but you saw the way he got the ball and uh, you see Caleb Benning there. We'll talk about him in a minute, but yep. um, just so many weapons, such a great distributor. And. You know, we don't. I, did, I was trying to figure this out, but he started the state championship game in Class A three straight years, yep. which I don't know if that's ever happened before. So mm. uh, he definitely submitted himself. First of all, it's hard to make the game three years in a row, let alone start varsity quarterback at a powerhouse program as a sophomore, junior, yeah, senior. Eric didn't. Even, Eric played early, but I don't think they made the. Miller North never made the championship. When he was game. there, wow. No. Okay. Uh, Fred Petito didn't win his championship till post Crouch. Oh wow. Um, you got to remember the 90s in Nebraska was dominated mainly by Lincoln teams. Sure. Um, so, you know, we didn't really see the Omaha run begin until the mid to late 2000s. Yeah. And now. You'd have had Nick Boss done a couple of yeah, years. Yeah, Nick Boss started <laughs> up. I don't know if he did three, though. Yeah, just two. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, what a run. And then, you know, Caleb Benning as well. Um, sure. You know, future Husker, we got to see him get an interception and a touchdown uh, to close things out. And, you yeah. know, I thought his catch at the end of the game. Uh, was just you know a real cap off to a great career at Westside yeah. and uh, everything he put up and now we're going to see him at Nebraska exactly and then Christian Jones who is of course 220 25 as well yeah and you talk about highest ranked guys on the field Christian Jones the number one guy right now for 2025 right. four star recruit has USC has Oklahoma Nebraska Notre Dame um, there are going to be a lot of coaches that make their way into Omaha in right January yeah. uh, to get a jump on Christian Jones and you know, we saw the pick six and we saw him, um, you know, get the other touchdown. I mean, just a versatile athlete. And what I liked about Westside is their top guys played two ways. Caleb yep. Benning was two ways. Mm -hmm. Christian Jones was two ways. Teddy Rizak, um, you know, a lot of teams in Class A now specialize guys just one side of the ball. I mean, they, they make sure their dudes are on the field. Even Anthony ways. last year played some uh, outside linebacker stuff. But also, yeah, you mentioned Teddy, who's going to be going to Notre Dame. And then there's also Jamez Ross, who's very good as well. A lot of good talent. Yeah, uh, that was a loaded roster, uh, you know, Keenan Cotton as well. Yep. Uh, has an Iowa State offer. Um, so the Warriors aren't going anywhere. I mean, they're, they're going to be uh, right back there. I'd imagine Steve Warren's son uh, will be their starting quarterback next year. Right. Um, as a freshman, he was seeing time on their varsity um, because they won games so handily. So uh, they are in good shape for the future. Yeah, Ja'Cory Barney, let's talk about him. You talk about uh, receiver for Nebraska. Ja'Cory Barney is a part of a very deep class out oh, of yeah. Miami, uh, a speedster. Um, they continue to try to stockpile speed and athletic ability. And we saw what uh, that did this year. I mean, just you know, guys like Jalen Lloyd and, and Malachi Coleman, you know, Matt Rule, what they want to do, they want to run the ball, be physical, and then open up plays over the top. And Ja'Cory Barney's another talented receiver out of Miami. You know, Evan Cooper is a Miami guy on the staff that knows the area very well. And Phillip Simpson, as uh, you know, is a uh, former Miami high school head coach. Yep, shows these freshmen who they can come in and get on the field what happened this year. Sean, we appreciate it. Recruiting updates each and every week from Sean Callahan. Let's go to our sideline survey this week. It's time to check in to see what you have to say. What is the biggest letdown against Wisconsin for you? Was it the offense, the defense, or the special teams? I think this week, this was a pretty easy answer as well. We've got a couple weeks where special teams have struggled. So 45% of people saying special teams. Let's get into Iowa now and talk about them. Uh, Kurt Ferentz has had a really, I mean, say what you want about this season. We're all parents <laughs> having to deal with your son getting criticism, getting essentially fired, staying on the staff. It, it has to be tough. I, I can only imagine the, having the running total of how many points, yeah. you know, and he's, he's yep. hit uh, through 12 games. Obviously, the decision, you know, being made uh, just a couple weeks ago. i will be interested to see how Kurt makes a decision on his coaching future even after this game, too. Yep. Um, just having that relationship. You know, he's been at Iowa for so long. Uh, but uh, yeah, tough, a tough, tough situation. But uh, even amongst all that, they're still able to understand who they are, understand what's going to work, rely on their defense, rely on their special teams, and and they win the West again. Yeah. <laughs> even with the, the offensive issues and uh, and in the uh, drama that behind the scenes with with the Sun this year. Who's their best offensive player? 
Because, I mean, Lottie, they're good, always well, their best I, I, player, I but he got hurt. I think they're going to try to get the deuce loose. So I think yeah. got to start with Caleb Yeah, uh, with a K. Um, you know, they get their one or two explosive runs a game. Mm -hmm. and it's usually him. You know, a lot of times it happens when they're salting clock. But, you know, they're so well coached. You know, they they were heavily on the recruiting trail, especially in our household. So we got a, a look into kind of how they teach. And with Coach Parker, I mean, he's... He's doing numerical data from, you know, hash to hash and, mm. you know, what a 12-yard throw is and what they're willing to give up and where you need to sit versus the formation and where the ball is on the field. What's a low-risk throw? What's a high-risk throw? Like, their attention to detail is what it is. And so it's not by accident that they can look a certain way and it's not real aesthetically pleasing and they're not phased by it because there's a blueprint that they operate under. Mm -hmm. Now where they get in trouble is if they have to get off script, obviously, right? right. You, you get some talented team that can defy numbers and, and, and have some scheme beaters, mm -hmm. then it's different. But I mean, the reason they do what they do is because they know who they are. Do you think that, that these two teams can combine for more than 26 and a half points? Well, if Chubba Purdy can pop some runs, exactly. I mean, in the field position and, and the field position, Iowa has a heavy advantage going in this game. They're Brian Buschini yeah. is on, his worst run over the last month that we've seen at Nebraska. Meanwhile, Troy Taylor might be the best punter on the planet. Yeah. And those 20 yards advantage that he's going to give them on punt versus punt, punt potentially, that's how Iowa wins games. And Nebraska's got to figure out a way to get some of that field position back because Troy Taylor will put Nebraska inside the 10 yard line a lot in this game. And that's a recipe for disaster. Got to make good decisions back there, whether to catch it or not. Oh, 100%. So good. there's there's two things I would imagine Nebraska's hammering this week. Uh, the punt return in terms of, you know, when and when not to catch the ball mm -hmm. and starting your offense inside the five. The 10 is a given. The five is where he'll get you. So you have to work punt when you don't get a full snap. Yep. If you're inside the five, and what do you want to do when you're inside your own five-yard line? Safety last week because of that. Their defense, they, Phil Park is obviously a great coordinator. They put so many corners into the league. Mm -hmm. What do you think about when you watch their defense? Just smart. Um... And obviously, without Cooper DeGene, you know, yeah. one of the best you know, guys in the secondary in the nation, he'll definitely be playing on Sundays. Um, they, 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 this defense always stays old, it seems like. They don't, they're, not, they don't, they're never playing a lot of true freshmen. By design. Yeah, yeah. and, and that's, that's, it is by design. That's why they're always so good. They're mature. Uh, they understand. They don't you know, get too far over their, their, their skis in certain situations. Um, defensive linemen. It, I've never remembered a school that put so many guys in the NFL that you're like, who's that again? <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, I, the, and even the guys that I do like, remember I was in love yeah. with Epinesa. Yeah. And right. everybody was like, well, he's falling or he can't do this, he yeah. can't do that. But there's so many guys. Still, play, right. still playing he's and now playing. he's starting to make plays. He's yeah. one of the tight ends. I mean, like, yes. La yeah, but Laporta was a Mac recruit until mm -hmm. Iowa made a late flyer mm -hmm. offer on him in January and he came to Nebraska's camp twice. And they told Laporta on his visit, you're going to be our fourth tight end, take it or leave it. He was still mad a year ago yeah. that they told him that, but he said because they were honest, yeah. he went with it. And now he might be the best tight end in the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> he is. He's definitely one of the top, top two in terms of uh, fantasy football. So you look at this matchup. Does it hurt Nebraska at all, these, this Black Friday, in terms of recruiting? Can you bring anybody in? Is it a, is it a, a, a last game that's always sacrificed recruiting-wise? It, it's, it's tough because... It's now it's 11 a.m. I, I yeah. like when they were playing it at three, it was better because you could still drive mm -hmm. guys in from four hours away. Right. But 11 a.m. It's hard for anybody. It's hard to get to Lincoln from Omaha. Especially for, Thanksgiving's the day before. <laughs> David's gonna yeah. not make that pregame yeah. show. Yeah. <laughs> 7 a.m. pregame yeah, show. Yeah. I'm like, whoa, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> but they'll, they'll have a couple guys. They got a running back target coming in as an unofficial. Okay. Uh, but the JUCO guys that they were looking at, um, no, no visit setup. So I, I do think what you're going to see is December. Um, they'll have for sure one big weekend, if not two, mm -hmm. uh, but it will be really busy. I mean, as you know, that race to that early signing day and then the January uh, enrollment day for transfer portal players, uh, we're, just get, we're just getting started. We're taping this early, so we don't know about this, but Anthony Grant, Nick Henrich both looked hurt at the end of the games. If there's no Anthony Grant, and it's just Emmett Johnson. What do you think? Well, I like the fact that I, I think they're looking for a reason to play eyes. So. Oh, yeah, Quinn Ives, sure. So uh, you, you will see him at some point, I believe, on, on Friday. And, you know, with Grant's injury, it was so fluky. You know, yeah. it was kind of post being on the ground, and his knee came back, and it, it, it didn't look good. But um, I walked out with Nick Henrich. Um, 
and saw him with his mom uh, at the bus. And, you know, that's a tough loss for them. But I think for Nebraska, it's by any means necessary sure. to get this one done for Iowa. They will pull all stops. Yeah, you got to get a lead, too. I know we talk about it starting <laughs> fast and all that, but a lead changes, as Damon says, the way they play. Oh, totally. Uh, you, you thought uh, I'd like – I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better start last week. Yep. The, the defense just wasn't able to kind of grasp that momentum when they needed to and, and, and extend that lead. But this week – Listen, Wisconsin's offense is more dynamic than Iowa's offense. Oh, exactly. I think that's yeah. we can all easily agree on that. Uh, you get, you get up seven nothing early, ten nothing. You put Iowa's offense in a in a situation that they're well, we very, saw it last year. Right, uh, very uncomfortable. Yep. In. They, they just, just took, they just ran out of time to mount a comeback exactly. because Nebraska yeah. did get ahead. So, you like if they can get off somehow to a good start, you like you like the Huskers' chances of this one for sure. Who are you picking, everybody? I got, I got, I'm, I got uh, Nebraska. I can't, I cannot pick Iowa. This is a, and this isn't even my heart. I, 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 I truly believe Nebraska wins this. Yeah, I have Nebraska. I mean, Vegas likes Nebraska. Yeah, I mean, I like I, Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys, that, you know, I, I think it's just a good, it's a better matchup because the quarterback can't run. Yeah, Mordecai's mobility yeah. was was a huge yeah. reason why they lost Nebraska's last week. Nebraska's going to second. Hill is not running. One hundred percent. Yes, like four on. times last week. What's your burning question? My burning question is, what can Matt Rule squeeze out of this team on a short week? Back-to-back, -back, Wisconsin, Iowa. This is as tough of a stretch as you're mm. going to see on a schedule. Uh, this one's easy for me. Can Nebraska function under the shadows of their own end zone? So I didn't bring up special teams in my last You did one. not, and, and they, they only turned they over kind of, once. Yeah, well, kind of. Some, you know, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, special teams in this one. Can Nebraska change the field and take advantage of some, uh, some scenarios with the special teams and kind of counterpunch with Iowa special teams? Yeah, and I'm going back to what Sean said because you can get – to their quarterback for Iowa. He's been sacked a lot lately, especially four last week. Get to him before it's a turnover as well. Don't forget to head to our website and Facebook page and click on the prediction. Jay Damon and I will tell you exactly what you can expect from this week's Black Friday matchup when Nebraska welcomes in Iowa Hawkeyes to Memorial Stadium. Kickoff for that game is a very early 11 a.m. and can be found right there on CBS. Then we'll be right back here on Tuesday to recap the game with our special guest, senior writer for Husker 24-7, Brian Christofferson. Our thanks to Zach Potter for joining us on tonight's episode. For Jay Moore, Damon Benning, and Sean Callahan, I'm Michael Severe. We'll see you next week right here on Big Red Wrap-Up.